Anton, Danny, look, the most handsome man on my podcast yet. No, are you, mate? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you, David. Um, how are you? How are you? I am awesome, man. This has been overdue, this podcast. I'm really, really excited to get to know you in public, uh, live, yeah, we, in front of my fans. Yeah, we had a we had a decent chat a few months back, and we were meaning to do this, um, but unfortunately, I got whisked away to Marbella. Well, not unfortunately, that was a good thing, of course. Um, but yeah, I'm uh, grateful to be on your show. Oh, it's a pleasure. And for the listeners, I'm not in Marbella with Anton. I'm still at home in Glasgow. Our lives are very, very different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what I love, mate? When I met you, it was a really random, sporadic interaction um, yeah. at the British Basketball League finals. I was with my friend who had some VIP tickets. You were there with some VIP tickets with your mum. And we are radically different people doing radically different things. But we yeah. came together under the guise of just like human to human interaction, broader social purpose. And we really got on and developed this relationship yeah. that led to this podcast. But you would never think. Like given how different we are, how much we would come together under the, the realm of podcasting interaction like that. Yeah, but that's that's what's amazing about it, David, the fact that you can just meet people from that you would never ever meet in your life. You can come together, you can have a conversation, and you know, we had a lot in common, we spoke about a lot of things, and that's why we've led to this. And you you heard a lot about my story, and I think you were a little bit taken back by my story as well. And um it's been nice to, you know, be brought into your show and be able to share that with plenty of other people as well. So Anton, if I were to ask you for the two people that don't know who you are listening to this podcast, who is yeah. Anton Daniel today in 2023? How would you answer that, mate? So, you know, obviously we need to address the elephant in the room anytime. Um, I was on Love Island in 2019, um, but very much as you guys will get to know my story um, from this podcast, that was never my route. That was never meant to be um, the angle I was going down. It just came into my life. I'm a massive believer in the law of attraction. And um, yeah, I believe that that was attracted into my life in a completely different way. Um, but Anton, the person, is a person that is in love with helping people achieve their goals and their bodies. Because ultimately, I went through my struggles with my, my own body, my own body image. And when I overcame that, I wanted to help as many people as possible do the same. So yeah, I like to always consider myself a problem solver. I love it, man. I love it. People say that what you pursue as an adult, you lacked as a kid. And given that you had your own problems as a young man, um, especially around the identity of your body image, can we take it back to that version of Anton and what life was like for him? Yeah, so to give everyone kind of a background of me, you know, um, I come from a multicultural background. So my mother's Burmese, which for those of the people that don't know, is next to Thailand. My dad's Italian and his dad was Ukrainian. So we had a real mix in our family of um, foreign bloods. And luckily enough, we were born in Scotland, so we've got this amazing accent, of course. Um, but yeah, basically um, what had happened was just with having all this um, different foreign bloods in the house, it was just loads of good food. There was nothing more to it than that. So it wasn't that way at bad. It wasn't that, um, you know, it was just there was a lot of good food and I like to eat a lot of food. And with that sort of came by the time that I got into high school, I was overweight. And as a consequence of being overweight, I was then bullied. Um, so for me, really, it goes back to when I went into high school initially, I'll always remember it. You know, there was a there was an older an older boy at school, and his name was Max. Hope Max doesn't mind me telling this story, but um, yeah, this guy was called Max, and he was sixteen at the time, and I was twelve. And the older boys in his year used to always bully this guy Max because he came from a foreign background. He was overweight, and then they used to come to me and say, "Anton, you're exactly the same as Max." The only difference is he's 16 and he's 16 stone and you're 12 and you're 12 stone. And as silly as that sounds, when I look back on it now, I do laugh, but that, that really hit me hard as a kid. And to the point where I was actually taking certain days off school because I had swimming and I didn't want to take my top off in front of my classmates. So yeah, it, it was obviously a really traumatic time for myself. I'd played quite a lot of sports at the time. I'd played football and as well, I was doing Taekwondo. I gave up these sports because again, I was just so 
unhappy within myself. I was embarrassed about the way I looked. So then I gave up the things I loved because of the way I felt. And as a result of that, when you start giving up activities, you become less active, you're still eating the same, you gain more, more weight. So I was in this sort of vicious circle at that time. And my mum sort of noticed this, um, probably by the time I was about, I think I was about 14, actually I was 15 at the time, um, because I remember she had to lie to the gym. Um, because at the time in the gym, you couldn't um, go in unless you were 16 years old. So my mum started dragging me to the gym at 5.30 every single morning before school. And as you can imagine, as a teenager, that did not go down very well at all. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, she dragged me to the gym and then started training. I then started to notice after the first sort of few weeks, I felt a lot better. I didn't have my six pack yet, but I felt a lot better. And what that then entailed me to do was to continue to go to the gym. I then took up my sports again. I became more active. I ate better. And as a result of that, my body started to change, which then in turn gave me more confidence. Um, so rather than being in a vicious circle, I was now in a more of a positive circle. That's unbelievable. That, th there's two um, core mechanisms that I see unfold in your story. The first one was when someone said to you, Max is 16 stone and 16 years yeah. old. You're 12 stone and 12. Yeah. Uh, tw 12 stone and 12 years old. That has obviously been ingrained in your brain ever since. Like It's like an early trauma, an early pain point that you've revisited yeah. that you used um, self-destructively. Like It just shows you the weight of words on kids. Yeah, That's absolutely. Huge. And I think the way people turn out, it does come from their childhood traumas. And for me, that is why I am the way I am and why to a point that I did become so addicted to, to the gym and the fitness lifestyle was because of these childhood traumas I had. I mean, I would always remember people would always say, oh, he's a big boy, isn't he? You know, and it's small things like that that just always stick with you as you as you um, grow up and no matter what, I'll always remember that, that Max comment. And funnily enough, I'd seen a few years later um, when I was maybe about 21, 22, um, I'd seen a few of the day boys out and they were like, oh, hi, Anton, how you doing? Um, you look great. And I was just looked at them and I went, well, you look like shit. They had their beer bellies now, you know, the, whatever. And that's, that's, that's how much, you know, I'd still held that hatred for all the years towards these boys. Um, obviously now I'm a little bit older, you know, I, I'm not um, like that in any way. But when I was younger, it really had an impact on me. Oh, man, and given that you were so almost like revenge, like in that comment, it makes yeah. me think of a quote that I really like hold dear dear to me. It's like all forms of hatred are are a form of self hatred, yeah. or all, all all forms of um, projection are uh, another form of self projection. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, sorry, David, go on. So I was just saying, I, I feel like you were still like. Yeah, it's still that hate about yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this was the thing. I mean, I, you know me, I'm, I'm not a type of guy in any sort of way. I always like to bring people up rather than put them down. But that was that one moment where I could almost get back what I'd taken for all the years and what I'd actually been put through all the years. This was such a small comment to these guys that probably never even thought about it ever again, which has haunted me for years and years and years. And I've built up so much hatred towards it and it's actually driven me in a positive way as well. But this, they're probably sitting thinking, what's his problem? You know, whereas because it's been such a small thing to them. But I, d I didn't realise that at the time, I was still a young kid then. Um, and yeah, it, it was kind of like my way of getting back at them at that point. It's crazy how our perception um, really bends our reality um, yeah. and the way we live our lives. Like you said, that they would have perceived that as such a small thing that they probably can't even remember saying to you. Yeah. And it's never had a, an impact on their lives and the direction and things that they've chosen in life. Whereas to you, that was such a big deal. It ultimately shaped your entire career and your entire yeah. outlook on life. It's crazy. So now that, but now, now that we look back on it and we're having this conversation, and if it was now, I actually should have thanked them. Rather than yeah. actually, if you think about it, because it's actually, who would have known? Maybe if that never happened, it wouldn't. I wouldn't have driven me to do what I've done now and where I've came in my life. So it's mad how small, small things in your life can make massive differences. And the second component about your childhood, 
experiences, Anton, that I picked up on was this kind of positive feedback loop. So you said you started yep. going to the gym and yep. you started to feel good about yourself, you had confidence yep. and you enjoyed the process. And that gave you like a trigger to continue doing those things. Um, yep. And it's just crazy how like, how important feedback loops are in terms yep, of but, projection. But it's, funny, it's funny you say that because it's just actually clicked something in my head that whenever there's a problem in my life, my go-to is the gym. That's my go-to. If my granddad died, go to the gym. You know, if something bad happens, I break up with my girlfriend, go to the gym. And it's mad how actually, because of that was what had made such a big difference in my life and made me happy and was my safe zone, that's where I always go when anything bad happens within my life. Wow. Man, I'm so glad that we could uh, have that breakthrough in this podcast, man. That's, yeah. that's, that's interesting, mate. I wanted to look back on your multiculturalism as a young yep. man in Scotland. I've heard yep. numerous accounts of how that is perceived in school and how being diverse in that sense can often lead yep. you um, as an kind of outcast or um, can bring up certain um, periods of isolation in school. Did yep. you ever have any sort of effects because of your multiculturalism? No, no not so. I can't say it that from any point I've ever experienced any sort of racism, I can't say I've ever experienced that in my life. Um, whether I was just, you know, I know it still goes on in this this day and age, um, but I think as the years have went on, it is less. And I know that when my mum was at school, she experienced terrible amounts of, of racism when she was at school. Um, but for me, it was just more the, literally the weight side of things. It was just totally all about me being overweight and that, that was it. Mm. Uh, that's. I wonder how much your mum has instilled strength in you because she's experienced, experienced so much racism, how much strength and tools and resilience that she's passed on to you to be able to deal with all forms of childhood adversity in that sense. Yeah, I mean, my mum's been described as a helicopter mum and I'd never heard this same um, saying before, but basically it's hovering over your child and before they're about to fall, you catch them. And that is the way my mum's always been. She's took as many hits from me as she can. Sometimes she just needs to let me go out and do it <laughs> and actually learn the hard way. But she's always tried to take as many hits as she can from me, for me. Um, and that's got a lot to do with where our, her childhoods came from. She's she's had a very hard upbringing with, with a, a few things, not only, um, not only with the race side of things. Um, my mum was actually adopted as well. So this then we stem back to what we're actually saying about how you, you have your childhood traumas. My mum's very, very protective of me because I think she was actually given up by her own mother and by her own um, father. So that's why I think she, um, she has that sort of protection with me. Again, her younger brother died at 21 as well. So even to this day, um, if I go out on a night out, my mum will say, what time are you coming in? And I'm like, Mum, I'm 28 now. Come on, like, you know? But she's like, she just always can't sleep until I come home. And I think that's to do with her childhood traumas as well. Oh, man. I've had the opportunity to meet your mum, and I can see that in her. She is such a, 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 a giver in the sense of she will protect those and give to those around her that mean a lot to her. And yeah. I feel like she has played such a fundamental role uh base in your career like she seems like your agent and your biggest fan at the same time have there been moments where your mom's like totally navigated you towards opportunity yeah many of times um if we go back now to just before i had um, started up my fitness business which we'll obviously touch on as we go along um she had met with these guys that had their own boot camp company um, um, I think about doing some sort of retreat work um, on their property and yeah the, the, the first thing she always say, uh, done was introduce me to these guys and you know say can Anton come and do some like voluntary work and learn from you how to do boot camp so that's that's obviously the first stage um, where I noticed it massively where she would push me towards that you know she made me do singing lessons she tried to make me do guitar lessons she tried to, and just for the record i can't sing i gave that up very quickly but oh mate give, give us a tune go on <laughs> oh i can't i can't i know my mom would want me to sing the anton's mom shaves his bum but no we're not doing that <laughs> um but yeah she's always tried to drive me in the right direction and push me towards things um which is obviously 
benefited me a lot. Don't get me wrong. We've we've had our arguments along the years, of course, when when that happens. But when you actually look back on it all, you do know that she's just done it out the best for me. She's just always looking for the best for me. It's amazing, given that given the reflections on her circumstances, it seems like she never really had these opportunities that you that no one was there to look after her in the same way that she could look after you. And perhaps she's projecting what she's seen in her early upbringing and wanted to make sure that you never experienced some of those hardships by giving you abundance in your in your own childhood. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's why, you know, a lot of my friends say, oh, your mum's a bit much with you. Or if people meet my mum, they'll say the exact same thing. And people have even said that my, my and my mum's relationship's weird. But I heard a, a very um, interesting quote the other day was, don't judge someone until you understand them. And what that basically means from the interpretation I got of that was until you understand someone's story, don't judge them. Don't judge it because you don't know what they've been through for them to get to that point. And, you know, that's exactly how it is with my mum. Sometimes I feel my mum should come with a disclaimer, to be honest. Um, and you'll know that yourself with me, you know, David. But she is who she is and she stays true to that. And it's just because of the stuff she's went through in the past that we've got to where we're at today. And I totally understand that. Shout out Sherry Ann, what a legend. Get you in that your both your mum and dad are entrepreneurs and they've had um success with their own popcorn business. What ah yeah. uh, has that kind of instilled in you in terms of this kind of visualization of entrepreneurship that was at your doorstep every day? And, yeah, and so to, give, could, to give the audience context, could you tell tell them what your, your parents did as well? Yeah, 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 of course. So my mum and dad were actually the first makers of popcorn in Scotland. Um, they started up their popcorn business in 1991. Um, they've been through literally the mill to get to where they are today. Um, you know, bankruptcy, everything to, to get, well, on the borderline of bankruptcy, everything to get to where they are today. And they've worked extremely hard their, their whole lives. And that's always been installed in me. A prime example was when I was six years old, um, I came home from school and I'd said, um, oh, mum, all the kids have you know got a PlayStation. Can I have one? And she would say, well, son, how much is a PlayStation? And I would say, you know, I think 200 pounds at the time, 300, I'm not sure what it was. Um, and she would say, okay, son, you need to work a week in the popcorn factory for that. So that was always the way I was brought up. Um, and a lot of the times going up over the years um, with mom and dad having their own business, yes, they, they did potentially have the money and they always have, I've never done without, but they always made me work for absolutely everything. Do you think that's a mindset that you'll adopt when you have children? Absolutely. I don't think there's any other way by it. Um, because when you don't understand how to make your own money, then I do believe that you don't respect it in the same way. If you're given a thousand pounds, how can you appreciate what that actually means to earn it? You know, and you can just spend it. Whereas when you actually earn that and you know how many hours it takes to earn that, you look at it differently. Given that your parents grew this business into such a successful organisation, but you also had to work for your keep or your your, your earnings or your, your material possessions, yeah. did any of your friends or the wider domain have any misconceptions about you because you came from this family that had a successful business on its doorstep? No, actually, do you know what? I think because people have always got to know me first, then anyone that's ever been in a the circle, they can't have any other opinion because they see the way I am, they see the way my mom is with me, they see the way my dad is with me. There's no two ways about it that I'm hardworking and they're hard on me. So stop, there's, there's plenty of families out there with a lot less money than what my family have got. And I'm sure their kids get a lot more than what I ever got as well. Just because if you've got it, doesn't mean you have to give it. Too right, mate, I love it. Let's talk about the ranch fitness retreat. Yep. Your uh, your boot camp, your gym, um, yeah, Blake and Paul of Island. Yeah, so that. yeah, so obviously touching back on, I went and started working for this boot camp company and um, during the summer holidays. It was actually during the summer holidays that I was meant to go from high school to university, and at the time I was going to go and study sports science at university, and I'd started working for this boot camp company during that, that summer holiday and I just loved you know doing it helping out I wasn't getting paid or anything for it it was just for purely experience and I'll always remember the guy said to me the, the owner of the company he says so what's happening next Anton you know and I was like well the, the idea is to go to you know university 
do my sports um, science degree and then come out and find a job and and he says, well, do you like doing what you do now? And I was like, yeah, yeah, this is what I want to do, something like this. And he says, well, you do realise that you can go to university and you can set these qualifications, but as soon as you come out, you'll have to set your fitness qualifications to become an instructor, you may, um, you know, your PT course, etc. That That qualification effectively doesn't mean anything within this industry. Not that it doesn't mean anything, but you still need to do the same test in order to do this. He said, so why don't you just miss the four years and go to uni? and go and do your fitness qualifications now. And you know, it was the best bit of advice I'd ever got, as silly as it was. Um, and I went and done my fitness um, qualifications and became a, f- a fully qualified fitness instructor by the time I was 17. And then when we'd started working with the bootcamp company, I um, I'll always remember my mom, she kind of had the conversation with me and she was like, look, I'm, this might sound a little bit arrogant or whatever, but I'm just going to say it how it was said. She said, our people don't work for other people. That's what she said to me. And I was like, but mum, I'm 17, you know, I've got a good job. She was like, look, just get yourself, we've got the space here in the field, get yourself out there, and what's the worst that can happen, kind of thing. And I was like, right, okay. So did it, started off with literally two people in a boot camp field, I'll always remember there was one boot camp that I put on and no one turned up, um, which disheartened me a little bit. But, (laughs) you know, at that age, you've just got so much um, enthusiasm. Life's not really knocked you down in business at that point. So you're just, you know, get up and go, get up and go. Um, And what I started doing was um, obviously Facebook at the time. And then I started doing leaflet drops. So all day long, I would literally, I just got, I think I got something like 10,000 leaflets dropped off. And every day I would just get in my little car, drive to an iron town and just go through letterboxes all day, all day, all day. And then before I knew it, it, um, I'd actually built up my boot camp from two people in a boot camp field to having 50 people in a boot camp field. Um, So that was kind of the first stages of the the ranch. It was more of a boot camp company at that point. Then the winter starts to come in in Scotland, so it's it's very cold outside. So um, it comes in around August then, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, you literally get like a few months of summer and that's it. But yeah, so um, you know the the darker nights started to come in, and then we had had a woodshed up at the ranch. So I ended up knocking the woodshed in and um, making it into like a small class area. So then I started putting on more classes. More people started to come, word of mouth started to spread. My business just kept growing and growing at this point. Um, so then the, 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 the class area became a small PT studio. I started personal training clients all day. I had the classes at night. So I was basically doing that at that time. I think I was, you know, 18. I was probably doing about maybe about 16, 17 hours a day sometimes, you know, just right through from the morning, right through to night, doing the admin stuff in between. Um, and just, but it never ever felt like that because I just loved it. And I loved the fact that it was just growing my business. Um, these people were coming to see me and it was just, it was just the most amazing thing. And one of the actual happiest points in my life was just because I was so naive to it. And it was just growing, growing, growing. Um, so then from that point on, um, the next stage was then going into kids fitness. So as I kind of mentioned before, with me being overweight as a kid, it was always a passion for mine to help as many kids as possible and not go through what I went through. And um, yeah, what I'd started to realise as well from a business point of view was a lot of people weren't maybe attending classes because they never had childcare. So I was like, right, okay, my adults' classes are pretty well established at this point. I can pay an instructor £25 to come in and cover the class. And then what they can then do is put a kid's class on at the same time and charge for the kids as well. So what I ended up happening, I basically doubled my business overnight doing these um, kids classes. So that was going really well. Then eventually the the ranch expanded again. I took the biggest risk in my life when I was about 23 at the time. And I took my small PT studio and I turned it into a, a fully equipped gym that opened up to the public. So then that was going really well as well. And then the final steps was when I done the kids summer camps. So the kids summer camps, um, what would happen is during the kids summer holidays, I would take the kids on for the full week. um, And they would come for me between nine o'clock and three 
3 p.m. like they would at school. So the parents would drop them off. They'd be with me all day. I would, you know, teach them how to exercise, teach them the importance of making their bed. But I'd put them into teams and give them points for everything they were doing because what I started to realise early on in this journey with the kids is kids won't do something unless they get a reward for it. So <laughs> my way of doing that was putting them into teams and getting them to... Um, you're giving them points for every time they were they were doing something or they behaved themselves or whatever it was, taught them about healthy eating. And what had actually happened at the end of these weeks was, was quite amazing. The parents would come back to me and be like, Anton, what have you done with my kids? And, you know, they're making their bed, they're eating healthy, they're wanting to exercise, you've completely changed my life. And this at this point was when I realised that this could go bigger. But I won't dive into this right now because I'm sure you've got some questions regarding what I'm saying. But that's then how it leads on to Love Island, which is quite um, ironic. The fact that a kid's fitness thing has led into Love Island. Um, but yeah, this is the part that I'm always excited about telling because a lot of people don't know this about me. And I guess before we touch on the Love Island stuff, yeah. the archetype of someone that's on Love Island is quite arrogant, full of themselves, yeah. self-assured. And even if yeah. they're not on the villa, it's edited in a way that will make them be perceived as that. Yeah. But I just love how that we've just reflected for like 10 minutes on how excited you were, regardless of how much you were getting paid for it, to like transform people that are ones like you. Yeah. And it really seemed, especially at that age, that you found something so early on that felt like work to others, but felt like play to you. If anyone else was to do those long hours, they couldn't do it, they'd be burnt out, they'd be stressed, yeah. there'd be a job for them. To you, it was just, it was play. It was purpose, it was play, it was passion. And that's why I do think that anyone that thinks of starting out a business, you should never actually think of it, what's going to make me money? We all like to make money, let's face it. In a lot of ways, you know, money makes the world go round. A lot of people agree, a lot of people won't agree. But then when people say that, I'll say, name five things you want to do. And I guarantee at least two or three of them will involve money. So <laughs> money does make the world go round in a lot of ways. But one thing I will say is if you're driven by money, then you're not going to be able to do the hours. You're not going to be able to do it. You need to find your passion. What are you passionate about doing? And find a problem to solve. And that's what I done. I just I was just passionate about fitness. It changed my life. I wanted to help as many people as possible change it. Never did I think I'd be able to do it in the scale that I've been able to do it now. But that's what I believe the reason it's worked is because the life my life's just opened up in front of me as I went along. I've just been going along the journey. I never planned half of it. It's just happened, but I put in the work. I worked so hard and I had the passion for it and it was just a recipe for success. Too right, my man. When I reflect on one of the quotes from my last podcast guest, a really great poet, artist, um, he used to host a podcast with Logan Paul, Logan Paul's podcast, Mac. He's become really poetic and one of the things that, one of his poems, there's a line from it that just summarises what you just said there was, Life is like sitting backwards on a train. It only reveals itself once you've gone past it. And I feel like yeah. with your story, like it all makes sense now that you've yeah. like been through that journey, mate. Like you've been yeah. able to connect the dots. Like this is why I was so passionate. That's why I had such impact. This is why I went on Love Island. Like it all seems to have just come to a natural yeah. conclusion. Yeah, I don't think you can ever plan out your your journey in life. You know, every time you you drive forward, there's another. You've always got an option whether you take a right or a left, and you have to make that option at that time. You take that, and it'll lead on to something else. And that's that's what I believe, and that's just what's happened. Then everything will open up in front of you. Yeah, I like that as, adv as advice. What are you passionate about? What does the world need more of? And yep. what will someone pay you to do? And if you can find yep. something that ticks all those boxes, then you're just going to be yep. happy regardless. Yeah, absolutely. I, I believe that massively. And I think the problem is with people out there that they just they are too focused on the outcome rather than actually solving the pro problem that's in hand or what they're actually passionate about. Because there's going to be hard days in, in any sort of business that you go through. And half the time, if you actually look back, and you were told these problems and obstacles that you'd come up against. I, if you were told this in the beginning, I don't know whether you'd start. But the thing is, when you're that passionate about something, you just keep driving forward. I love that. One of my favourite quotes is by, do you know Jim Carrey, the actor? And yes, my yeah, yeah, yeah. Dumber. Yeah. He, I mean, he's, it's, he's amazing because he comes across like such a silly character that he plays, but he's actually a very intelligent man. That's uh, He's unbelievable. He's so like... 
awakened to the world. He sees life way different than most people that I've ever kind of yeah. consumed or came across. But like you said, yeah. on screen he's so silly, class clown yeah. kind of character. But in fact, yeah. he's so in tune. Well, he he was reflecting on his dad's story. I think his dad, and that's funny that I'm saying this because I'm an accountant. But his dad was an accountant, worked for 25 years in a job that he did not like, uh, and got sacked, and they were made redundant. And he came up with this quote that you can fail at what you don't love, so you may as well try what you love. Yeah, oh, that's that's such a superpower of a quote, mate. Yeah, but it's, it's true. It's very very true. So, given this early chunk of your story, that episode where you were on this mission, trying to reach as many bodies as possible, was Love yeah. Island and the attitude to go on to Love Island just a vehicle to amplify the mission that you were already on? So it was never in the radar. It was never a thing. The only other time I seen Love Island was when I watched it with my girlfriend. And yeah, I loved the show, but for me, it was never, I, I was never in my, what, what would I want to do with Love Island? It was never in my chain of thought. So going back to our earlier story, um, you know, the, the parents are starting to come back to me and, um, you know, say, what have you done with my kids? They're amazing. And it, I, I just thought to myself at this time, I need to hit more people. I need to hit more people with this, you know? I need to, I just always wanted more. I can't explain it. I just always wanted more for myself. I still always do want more for myself. Um, I'm never, ever, ever satisfied. I just want more. And when um, this had happened, um, I was listening to Tony Robbins at the time. So anyone that doesn't know, I know I'm sure most people will, but Tony Robbins is the, the number one motivational speaker in the world, or he was at that time. I think Eric Thomas is maybe overtaking him now, but um, Tony Robbins is, like I said, a massive motivational speaker. And I was listening to his self-development program at the time, Getting the Edge, and basically what he had said was, find someone that's doing what you do and role model it. So basically copy what they do and just reverse engineer it rather than actually sort of going, how do I reinvent the wheel? So this just clicked for me in my head. I was just like, right, how can I hit more people? Okay, exercise DVD. At the time, back then, it sounds like I'm an ancient man now talking about exercise DVDs, but at the time, um, exercise DVDs were a big thing. And it just clicked in my head. I said, right, okay, what if I do a kid's exercise DVD here? So then I started to think, okay, what is the, who's doing exercise DVDs for kids? Is anyone? So quick search into Google, tried to find if anyone was doing kid exercise DVDs in the UK, and there wasn't at that time. So I thought, okay, this is, this is good. This is a positive. No one's doing it, which is, which is a good thing. So then I looked up what was the most successful exercise DVD of all time in the UK. And I can't remember if I, if I told you the story, David. I think I might have heard a little bit of this when I first right, met well, you. Yeah, well, do you know who it was who had the most successful exercise DVD of all time in the UK? Mr. Motivator, as I guess. Yeah, most people say Mr. Motivator, Davina McCall. No. Charlotte Crosby from Geordie Shore. <laughs> so really? I was, yeah, really. Body Blitz, I think it was, sold the most copies ever of an exercise DVD in the UK. Um, so I was quite taken aback by this, bearing in mind, you know, I'm, I'm 20, 23 at the time, I think I'm, no, actually that's a lie, I'm probably about 22 at this point, 22, 21 at this point. So I'm still really, you know, watching, like I still watch reality TV, I still watch Geordie Show and Love, but to be honest, um, watch Love Island. So obviously Charlotte was known on the show for pissing the bed. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, this can't be right. Like, she doesn't do fitness, or I'm just like, am I missing something here? And I thought, right, okay, that's a bit strange. So I looked up her management company, and I found that her management company was a company called Bold Management. So I said to my mum, I says, look, mum, go and do me a favour. Go and phone up this management company <laughs> and see if they'll bring out a, an exercise DVD with me for kids. And my mum, being my biggest fan, obviously wanting to do everything for me, she was like, yes, son, no problem, I'll phone them up. So my mum picks up the phone uh, to this management team and she's like, hi there, um, I've seen the things that you've done with Charlotte. My son's name's Anton Danny Luke. He's owned his own fitness business for the last seven years. He's worked with kids for the last five years. He's looking to bring out a kid's exercise DVD. Would you be interested? And they just turned around to my mum and said, well, is he a celebrity? 
And my mum's like, well, no. And they said, well, I'm really, really sorry. We only deal with celebrities. And my mum beat my mum, David, you know what she's like, very straightforward. She just turned around and said, have you seen my fucking boy? And <laughs> I remember just, that story there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, they just kind of laughed on the phone. Um, and they're like, like, well, do you respect? Like, we don't. And mum says, look, just can you give me your email address? I'll just want to send you a few pictures of my son. Um, and I think they just wanted her off the phone. If I'm honest, I think they just wanted her off the phone. So they gave her the email address. Um, and my mum sent over photos. Within about 10 minutes, I get a phone call back and they asked to speak to me. So they came on the phone and they were very much like, hi, Anton, we've just been speaking to your mother. Uh, we think you'd be really good for like TV shows like X on the Beach or whatever reality TV shows there were at the time. Um, and I was like, look, this is how focused I was at this time in my life and how much of a reputation I'd actually built up. I was just like, look, with all due respect, like, I'm not interested in being on any reality TV show. I was like, like most 21-year-old, 22-year-old kids would jump at that. But I was just like, I've built up my business. I want to be taken serious in what I do. I just, I'm just not interested in it. I want to bring out a kid's exercise DVD. And they're like, look, Anton, you've got to understand that how it works these days is you need to be a somebody and this and, you know, they types of things. So I was like, right, well, look, it's, it's fine. So at the time, they'd followed me on Facebook. They'd followed me, they'd followed me on Facebook at the time. And over the years, they would start to send me. So that bear in mind, this was 2016. I went on Love Island in 2019. So over the years, they would start to drop me messages, you know, like, do you want to do this show? Then I think Survival of the Fittest came about at one point. Do you want to do that show? And I was just, no, no, no. And I always remember it. February 2019. So bearing in mind over these three years, I'm still building my business. And I'm still doing really, really well for myself and helping people. But I always wanted to do more and I always wanted more. So 2019 came and it was February. And I just spot up my girlfriend. And it actually came at the time on Facebook, Anton Danielik is single. <laughs> Not long later, I get a call from this management company that I'd spoke to all the years ago. Hi, Anton, there's an opportunity for Love Island. Would you like to do it? And the rest is history. Um, so I've ended up then going on Love Island. Um, we can obviously talk about that a little bit. Went on Love Island, obviously came off, done very well from it, and then managed to then go on and write a kids' fitness app all these years later. So going back to what we were talking about earlier, David, sometimes you don't, life, life's so unexpected. I could never have ever planned that route in my life, you know? And it's just amazing how it's worked out. And I'm a massive believer in the, the law of attraction. Um, you know, think, believe, receive. I really, really do believe in that. Some people think it's rubbish. Some people think it's whatever. But I, I believe that the things that I've put in my life have actually happened to the point of that I always, once I kind of got that message from the management company, I still had to go through all the audition processes of Love Island. So there was like four different audition phases. But I wrote in my um, gratitude book at the time, first day in Love Island, 3rd of June, 2019, in February. And what had actually happened was, um, we went through all the audition phases, and as I was coming off, people would say, oh, how do you think you've done? I was like, smashed it, got it, smashed it. That's all I kept saying, really, really cocky about it, like, as if I'd got it. I just, I can't explain it. I had this inner feeling that I was going to get it. And when I got to, um, we got to the last stages, so I got a call um, from... The Love Island producers and they were like, right, Anton, um, we are we're we're gonna have you on the show, but you're gonna come in as a bombshell, but you are gonna be in the first half of the show. And I was like, Oh, right, what do you mean? I'm like, well, this self is a good thing, you sound disappointed, like you're you're gonna be on the show. 150,000 people applied for it this year, you know, you've 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 done well to get to this stage. And I just went, oh, okay, I just I thought differently, and then came off the phone because in my head. I'd had in my gratitude book that I was starting the show. I had that in my head from the start. And then a few hours later, I just got a phone call back and it just, Anton, we need to come to London um, this weekend. And then before I knew it, I was starting the show, which was, um, it was strange. It was so strange how, how it all panned out. One of the threads that I want to pull on from your story in there is reflecting on the DVD story, where you, you would think that the most acclaimed fitness DVD would be via yeah. PhD candidate with um, 20 years experience in nutrition or an ex-footballer perhaps or 
a bodybuilder or a bodybuilding coach, someone with the cred, uh, the creds in that space. But in fact, it was just a celebrity that was in not bad shape. Yeah. Yeah. And that brings to light a lesson I learned in one of my favorite books called The Formula, which is basically a, a book where this physicist called Albert Lazo Barabas, he looks at success and decodes it by science. And there's a really good example that's kind of aligned to this in that book that I'll hold really dearly to me. And it's reflecting on an artist called Rembrandt. And one of his most famous paintings is called The Man with the Golden Helmet. But for many of years, it wasn't actually worth that much because it was known to the public domain that it was one of his like mentees that, that um, painted it. So for 100 yeah. years, it was worth like £10,000 or the equivalent of that. I can't remember the exact amount. And in like 2009 or 2010, in the 2000s, it was learned that he actually painted it himself. So yeah. this one painting didn't actually change for 100 years. The painting itself remained yeah. the same. But then yeah. it was attributed to, attributed to him as the artist behind it. So it went from like yeah. 10, 10 grand to something like 100 million overnight. Yeah. And it yeah. just showed you that it was a superstar's name that propelled the worth. So yeah. in this case with a DVD, like it wasn't her expertise or how good this DVD was. It was just That's the fact that her name was slapped on it and made it number one. And yeah, absolutely. if I were to reflect on your story, you realized that, okay, I need to become someone in the public domain. And then I can start yeah. delivering this at a higher level. Well, higher well even even at, even at that, David, that wasn't actually my initial thought. That's what's funny about it. My initial thought was this, I need to find out who her management was. That wasn't even, it wasn't even like, or oh, I need to go and get famous. I need to go and apply for Love Island. It was, I need to find out who this girl's management is. I found out who her management was. And then they've then basically driven me to this show all the years later. It's just, it, was, I, I, it wasn't even like, I could have went, okay, so I need to be famous, right? I'm going to apply for Love Island or I'm going to apply. But that, that wasn't my chain of thought there at all. Really? But it just shows you that that chain of thought would have worked in the same way? Well, potentially, oh, okay. but maybe it maybe wouldn't have been my time to do the show then. And maybe it wouldn't have been the right time. Because, I mean, everything that's happened um, in the show, like, I mean, the fact that I lasted the full time as well is a massive part of my success from it as well. Because ultimately, if you went in and you went out in the first week, then you're, you're not going to be... You're not going to be able to do much. You'll get your year, year worth of fame out of it. You'll maybe be able to, you know, do a few PAs or something like that. But it's allowed me to then solidify myself, you know, as a known figure, I suppose, and a reputable figure as well. I love that, mate. One thing that I was, like, smiling internally at was when you posted on Facebook and it said Anton is single and yeah. then a management agency Oh. like pinched you and dropped you into Love Island like if I were to put on not that I'm in a relationship I thought if I'm in a relationship and I were to post on Facebook I am single the only comment I would get was probably my mates going I no fucking wonder <laughs> 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 like, handsome bastards like you get put into Love Island <laughs> yeah I know, I know. Uh, to be fair at the time as well I just thought what better way to get over a breakup you know to like, getting put in a villa with like X amount of hot potential puns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, mate, I'd love to reflect. I would love to reflect on your time on Love Island. Tell me yeah, the end-to-end yeah. -end process. How did the application process look? Yeah, so first and foremost, the first thing I had to do was send in a video. So in this video, this is probably where I probably set myself up to fail in a lot of ways because I made myself look a lot cockier than what I actually am. So really what, what I've always thought is, in these videos, you need to show who you are, right? And for me, uh, as Love Island shown, I was always shown as the funny guy. So I don't think sitting here saying, I'm really, really funny. I'm, you know, I make people laugh. That's that's not gonna do it. I actually had to show it. <laughs> so I I'd, I'd came up with a spiel. I don't know where the hell I got it from. So I, I'd say, um, you know, my name's Anton Danny, like Owen Moon, Jim in Scotland, blah, blah, blah. Um, I says, uh, I've always kind of seen the relationship like having a chocolate bar. Let's, <laughs> let's say your favourite chocolate bar is a galaxy. Yes, you go to this galaxy bar nine times out of ten, but let's face it, do you want that to be the only chocolate in your life? I don't think so. I said, sometimes you get a craving for a crunchy, sometimes you get a craving for a Twix, and then other uh, sometimes you get a craving for something else. Then I said, 
sometimes you get a craving for a Twix, which is two at the one time kind of thing. And I says, get me into that villa um, and I'll, I'll find my golden ticket or something like that. And uh, obviously it worked really well because like, where, who comes up with that? But again, then it's making me look like a lot better of a player before the, you know, the first stage. And then the second stage comes, I had to go down to Manchester. There was a camera on our face and there was about five other guys there. Um, as well and then they would just take us in one at a time um you know so i kind of like you know really prepared myself for this thinking what questions could they ask me i knew they would ask me questions where would you take a girl on the first date that sort of thing you know and i always remember they did ask me that where would you take a girl on the first date and i says well i'll take them to a shisha bar for three reasons first reason it's cheap second reason i love shisha and the third reason you get to see how they handle a pipe on the first date so these were the sort of things that I was coming out with, you know, and um, obviously it was just it was just genuine, genuine banter as I was going along. But it's, as you can see, it's starting to build this picture that I'm a dickhead. Um, so <laughs> we then went down and from that stage, it was then meeting the executive producers, the guys that make the show happen. So I sat down with both of them, had a conversation with them, and then um, we, got, we get the call, we get the call to go in. Um, and then someone comes and picks you up from your house, you fly over to Mallorca, you get your phone taken off you, you stay in a villa with this, you stay in a, a hotel with this person for a week, um, just while you know, you're doing your press shots, you're doing um, other pieces that you need to line up for the show, the producers come in and talk to you, and then obviously you, you go into the villa. Wow, that is such an accelerated process, especially that week before you go into the show, you get your phone taken off you and you're kind of held. Yeah, because what's, actually, what's actually happening in that week that you're away and you're taken into, what uh, well, it was actually called lockdown, and when you were taken into lockdown, that's when they would release the images of the cast. So you weren't allowed to see this, um, this if there was any bad negativity, because as you see every year, when Love Island's um, on and the cast is revealed, a lot of people get abuse and it's so that you don't see that and you're not put into a negative frame of mind before you go into the villa, which is makes a lot of sense. Do you think they are looking after your well-being or do you think they're just trying to get the best out of you on the show by doing that? Or both? Um, I've never actually thought about that question. Um, no, do you know what? I do think that I don't know how things were previous to, you know, the suicides that had happened in the show. I do think that they do take your well, uh, well-being very, very seriously. And, um, you know, we had access to a psychiatrist any day if we wanted to. You know, you could just come out the villa, speak to a psychiatrist if you needed to. Um, they do take care of it very well. I do I do believe it is to protect you, um, you know, for, for going into the show. So when you went into the show, mate, when you went into Love Island, what were your first impressions of the overall layout and the villa and the other contestants? The first thing I always remember thinking is it's much smaller than it looks on TV. <laughs> um, you were you like, know, uh, Airbnb, I'd send a bad review on this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously, I'm, I'm a very, very confident person. Like, uh, it's, it's very rare in life I get nervous, you know. With training, like, 50 women when I was a 17-year-old kid, I've just kind of always... I've always adapted to situations. I've always, you know, had confidence around me. And I always remember just standing at the front door and, you know, the the villa producers standing there. And she was really nice. She was lovely. She was just hyping us all up, give loads of energy, you know, when you go in, run in. And I just remember thinking, shit, this is, this is real, you know? And I felt really fucking nervous, like probably the most nervous I've ever felt in my life. Um, and my heart starts pounding. And then, you know, uh, I ran down and then, um, yeah, just, just, just got on with the show. That was it. What were your first impressions of the other contestants, especially the, the women on the show? Um, so initially, when we would walk down, I'd actually remember looking at the lineup and thinking, no one here's my type, which is quite ironic because no one wanted to pick me anyway. And it's easy probably for me to sit and say that. But I do remember thinking, all right, okay. And then um, one of the girls stepped forward. So it was quite funny because I was like, I was, I was, you know, when I went out in Glasgow back in the day, 
And when I was younger, I used to go and I could get any woman I want. And, you know, I thought it was the boy. And I think this was a little bit of a, a little bit of a humbling to me. This experience <laughs> when I've walked down there on national TV, thinking every girl was going to step forward for me. And one girl steps forward for me, I'm thinking, what the? F-? Like, I felt embarrassed. I remember feeling really, really embarrassed. And again, I think this comes down to, I think when I actually look back on everything in my life now as well, a big reason why I got into the gym and when I got into the gym, girls started to pay more attention to me. So I think I always was driven by that and it always fed my ego more. And then that was why I always wanted to get more and more girls because it fed my ego more because I was that fat kid at school. And then for this to happen to me in national TV, I was a bit like, that's a little bit humbling. And it made me step back and I felt, like I say, pretty embarrassed. Did you feel almost the way you felt when that kid said to you, oh, Max is 16 stone and 16 yeah. years old and you're 12 exactly. years old stone? <laughs> exactly. I said from this time, 6 million people were watching. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. That, that is, yeah. that is a, a humbling and yeah. uh, that's a mental experience. Not many people have experienced that level of... Uh, no. But to be honest, that and and to be what made it worse is this went on for four fucking weeks. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't get a girl to save myself for four weeks. I'm thinking, what the hell is going on? So that was a humbling experience. But what I decided to do, and I think that's why the audience took to me and why I survived so long, was because I walk in, this ripped guy, like you know, a bit of pretty boy, and I've said all these things that I've said in my VT. I'm, I'm literally hated. I mean, there was actually a GoFundMe page from Scotland to send Anton home in the first week, <laughs> which I never heard about until, until I came out. Um, so, yeah, the, the nation was embarrassed by me. They were absolutely embarrassed um, by the way I was acting um, prior to going in. And then I got in there and I was just kind of like, well, look, I'm here once. I want to be my, I'm going to be myself. I'm going to be who I am. I'm going to stay true to myself. People like me if they like me. If they don't, they don't. And luckily enough, then they did. Oh man, that's hilarious. What a story. Did you ever go in with the perception that you were going to find love in the villa? Mm, it was never in my chain of thought. I'm not going to lie. I never ever, I'm, I'm a realist with this sort of thing, you know. I, I think that for me, it was always a business opportunity. It was never meant to come about. The only reason it did come about was because of business. That was always in my thought thought process throughout it. And that's, people lie and say that's not the case, but it, it, it just is what it is. And that's, I just never ever thought there'd be a chance of finding love in there. And do you think that other people feel the same? They're not there to fall in love, but just to make headlines to some degree? Yeah, I mean, now nowadays it's, it's absolutely the case. I mean, how, how can you expect to find love on these TV shows? I mean, the, the, the TV shows went on for seven seasons now, maybe eight seasons, and there's probably a handful of couples still together out of 40 people that go in a season. Do your, do your maths, you know. It's not, it's not really going really to work out, is it? One of the most famous relationships that came out of the villa, and it was your season two, was Molly May and Tommy Fury. Yeah, and yeah. they're still together. They have a baby, but there's also yeah. loads of conspiracy theories that they're not actually together. And it's a publicity stunt. Do you think that's true love? Well, I, I'll be honest, and I was quite open about it in the villa. I did genuinely didn't think that it was um, at the time. I, th- I believed, as did the nation at the time, Molly was playing a game. Um, she was called Money May in it. And I believe that with what I've seen. But the guys who came out here, they've shown everyone wrong. They've got a family together. They look happy together. So I, I wish them all the best. And that's that's all Tommy ever wanted. Tommy didn't need to go in there for fame or anything. And Tommy was just genuinely needed to be loved. And he found that. Congrats to Tommy. Must, yeah. be, must be nice. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Were there any moments on Love Island that, have shocked you like any unexpected challenges or difficulties that you didn't expect to face um i think the hardest thing for me genuinely we've touched on a little bit was just being rejected as much as i was because i was never used to that and then it goes back to your ego then starting to play a part as well knowing that you're being rejected on on national tv you know it does play in your head that people are watching this your family's watching this and it just kept happening and happening and happening and it was, it was very, it was embarrassing for myself as much as I never shown that. 
Because what I decide to do and what I've always very much done is if someone takes the piss out of me, I'll take the piss out of myself even better or more. And people love that because I never take myself too serious. And again, that's probably comes from the childhood traumas that, well, I need to then cover my back by doing it more to myself. And that's what I've always just done. Um, and yeah, I think that's what the nation loved. I never took myself too serious. It was very much, oh, Anton, there's another pie. Took the pie, right, who's next? And just took the piss out of myself and that was it. Oh, class, mate. Some people who are listening to this podcast are like, David, hurry up and ask more about Love Island, like the, the nuts and bolts of it, the logistics of it. And people want to know, like, do you get to drink on it? Is it true you get a day off? Um, yeah. Is it true that they force you to sit outside all day? What are some of the unique components that make Love Island Love Island? Um, so, yeah, with regards to the drinking question, you were allowed one drink a night, I believe. Um, which would be put at the side for you. You would have your drink, that that was it. Yes, you would have the one day off a week. What would happen in that one day is they would split the boys and the girls. The boys would go to another villa, and the opposite week, the girls would go to that villa. Um, and on the days, you were allowed to listen to music, you were allowed to watch TV. Well, obviously, like Netflix or whatever, nothing that was, that was live. And you weren't allowed to discuss story. And what that means is, you're not allowed to talk about anything that's going on in the villa. So I couldn't say to one of the boys, oh, how's it going with so-and-so? We were allowed to talk about anything else other than that, which was nice, though, because in the villa, you weren't really allowed to talk about these sort of things because it doesn't become relative to the viewer, does it? If we're just having a conversation about someone's granny from across the road, like they want to know what's happening. There's, there's 24 hours in a day that's heading down into one hour. So they want to just have us talking story, 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 story constantly about what's going on, finding out situations. So, yeah, that's that's probably, um, there's, I mean, there's loads of other things that, that happen that, that, you know, you just would not would never expect. Loads of other things. We could be all here all day talking about it. Is it true that exec producers kind of instigate conversations, like kind of prompt you to go speak to specific individuals about certain topics or certain people? Yes, but they don't tell you what to say. So, for example, myself and Belle, we had an argument one night and um, I'm very much the type of person, if I fall out with you, I wouldn't speak to you. But they're like, well, Anton, you need to go and have a conversation with Belle. So you'd have to go and have that chat with them. And that would be it. You would just have to have your chats with certain people on certain days. That's it. It's not, you have to say this or you have to do this. How did it feel having your very own mum come into the villa and share the limelight with you because you ultimately went viral for a period of time. How nice was that or how unpleasant was that perhaps knowing that your mum was going to be on national TV alongside you given that you had this track record of failing publicly were you ever scared yeah. that that was projected onto your mum as well? No I just remember always counting down to the parents weeks and um, I think that happens on about week eight so bear in mind you're in there away from your family, not spoke to them. You know, I've always been very close to my family, speak to them every single day. Um, and to go that sort of length of time without speaking to both my mum and my dad was 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 um, really difficult. And I just remember when she came in, she just ran up, I picked her up and we both just started crying. Um, so no, it was, it was, there, was not, there was no other thought than I just wanted to get to that stage where she would come in. Oh man, I didn't realise, I'm only kind of now personifying it it's almost like jail but in the sun on live tv absolutely abso romantic uh, absolutely like i mean no matter if you're stuck in the most beautiful villa if you're stuck in the same place with the same people for a certain period of time it, you do go a bit crazy like i mean um i've always been very on top of my mental health and towards i mean every week i always remember and um, then saying you know Anton, do you want to see the psych? Because you would always, always, always get asked if you want to see the psych or not. And um, I was always like, no, no, I'm fine. Like, I do my gratitude. I'm this. Like, I was, and then towards the last week, I was like, could I go and see the psych? Like, I had to just get out and talk to, not even to talk, just, I just wanted to talk to someone else. <laughs> no wonder, mate. No wonder. I'm and then, then you're starting to, then you're starting to, as the weeks go on as well, you're starting to then feel the pressure more and more because you're starting to realise, okay, I'm really like to or like, and then you're scared to make steps in the wrong direction sometimes. You're like, shit, like what if I do this? And then you start overthinking everything, you know? And then I got to a stage where 
I mean, I was getting voted in the top couples when I wasn't even in couples. Like, I mean, it was unheard of. I couldn't believe what was going on. People were coming into the villa and saying, Anton, you're the national treasure. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Like, and I, I felt that pressure on me. I definitely did when I was in there. Oh my God, mate. Because I can imagine you'll have built up a narrative of how you think the public have perceived you based on your performance in the villa, but you've never actually had a chance at that moment in time, eight weeks in, to actually know what is actually being said about you. And then you have someone yeah. come in, say something that's maybe radically different to how you thought you were perceived by the public. For example, you were told that you were the national treasure, but in fact, you just thought you were failing in public for the last however many weeks. And then yeah. you're like, okay, now I have to play a different character and I have to play the character of a national treasure then. It's just, it just felt like a lot of pressure. I just remember just feeling the pressure as the weeks were going on. And then the final gets closer and then of course you want to get there as well. So then you're adding the pressure onto your, yourself. Um, it, it is, it's a, it's a difficult, it, it's a, as much as it's one of the most, the best experience of my life, it was one of the most challenging experiences of my life as well. We need to touch on the Anton's mum shaves his bum. What was that all about? Yeah. So, <laughs> the, the funny thing is, I came out the villa and we got our phones back after nine weeks. Um, and, you know, I've picked up my phone and I've got 900,000 followers on my phone here. And I'm like, I went in with 4,000 followers, you know, and I've got 900,000 people on my phone. And I remember looking at the, one of the second video as this razor wrap. Bear in mind, I've got no concept to any of this, where this came from, like, what's going on? Did I, I'm like, did I make a comment? Did I, 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 how's this out there? And it's got, like, something out, I think it was, like, 600,000 views on it. And it's my mum doing this fucking rap. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Then the next day, I go on um, Good Morning Britain, and Eamon Holmes and um, I think it was Kate, Kate Galloway or whoever it is that presents with her, I'm not sure. Um, they, they play it on this show, and we're obviously remote from um, Mallorca. And I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, still no contents to it. Um, but obviously what had happened was the very, very first day I stepped out, and um, Carol and Flack had actually asked the girls, like what, one of the girls, why did you not step forward from Anton? And she'd said, oh, do you shave your legs? And I was like, yeah, but that's not the only thing. My mum shaves my bum. And it was just a small comment like that. And it obviously it went viral in the UK at that time. And then your mum goes on and makes a rap about it and it goes through the yeah, roof. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And what was interesting about it is my mum always hated social media and, and never ever went on it. So I was just, I was so confused to what had happened. It's mental, mate. Like, leaving such an intense experience, then getting plummeted out of like a cannonball into reality, and then you have 900,000 eyes on you and a trending video about something that you can't even remotely remember even saying or yeah. that even mattered. How did you cope with that level of attention and um, publicity? Was it hard, man? You just don't have a choice. Like, you just get thrown into it. The only way I can describe it, and I'll always remember this, is walking through Mallorca Airport. I'm sorry, I think it, I mean, not even be Mallorca, is it Palma Airport or whatever it is? Um, airport. Um, to, yeah, it's Pal sorry, it's Palma Airport. Um, walking through there to go to Love Island and walking through no problem. When we came off the show nine weeks later, bear in mind all the the flights from Magaluf are coming from there, um, so the UK flights going into Magaluf, etc., are all going to there. We're walking through, all with security around us, people grabbing us, wanting photos. Like, it was just the most crazy experience, um, because you're just, a, in your head, you're still just a normal person. But then you go, and I'll, I'll stand by this comment, um, always, when you come off Love Island, at that moment in time, you're one of the most famous people in the country. And because people have been watching you for nine weeks, they've really bought into you. You are super famous at that point in time, to the point where you can't go anywhere without security. It was a crazy time. And correct me if I'm wrong, but brands and opportunities just fall at your feet. Like you have- crazy. You've got the Crazy. paradox of choice and you yeah, can navigate I, I, all this choice and fame and opportunities and what, how you're going to hang your career on what came next. Yeah, I mean, there was there was loads of paid paid deals for Instagram. I got a TikTok ambassador deal. I done the national lottery deal. Um, 
oh, I'd done so much. Um, and then on top of that, I had all my personal appearances. So I had to do 86 personal appearances in 90 days. Paid for? Yes. Can I ask roughly, not specifically, how much did you really make coming off of Love Island? You don't have to ask that answer. We got three grand a PA and I done 86 PAs in 90 days. That's all, that's all the fans need to know, that's all the listeners need and to know. Was, <laughs> and that was, that was without the, the deals, um, that was without the deals that came with it as well. Um, there was a lot of big deals as well. Um, it was a, a crazy time. I mean, I, I went from, from earning what I earned in a, in a year, and I earned a good wage in a year at that that time. I mean, I, I drove about now, like again, not sending cocky or anything. I'd, you've asked the question, so I'll answer it in the best way I can without giving full figures. But I drove about in a Porsche before I went to Mother Island. I'd done very, very well for myself. I had a well-established gym. But I probably went from making what I made in a year to making it in a week. <laughs> Holy so it was, it was, it was, it was, it was serious money. It was serious money. Again, reflecting on that Charlotte, Charlotte Crosby um, reflection, reflecting on that book that I was speaking about, it just shows you how much opportunity and money and all this stuff gravitated to you. Not for what you knew and your your um, personal values, but just how much following and engagement and hate there was around you. Um, it just increased your net worth. Essentially. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But what was great about it as well is one of the first investments I actually done was investing into my kids' app. That was the first thing I had to do and invest into my kids' app. And that wasn't a cheap investment to if anyone out there's ever built an app, it's not a cheap investment at all. And that was that was because that was a purpose for me going in there. So I knew I had to stick by my purpose and that was the first thing um I did invest in. And I can imagine that's such a rare experience for someone who typically goes on to Love Island. If I were to take a little stab in the dark at most people that went on the show and aren't superstars like Molly May or Tommy Fury or yourself, yeah, yeah. they would have left Love Island, had loads of PA for a year, and then yeah. they just became irrelevant and then had to adapt to that level of normality yes. again. Yeah, that's, that's why I think there's a lot of people that suffer with depression post-show because... The thing is, you are put on such a pedestal. You, you're, you're walking around, you know, ITV are, are bringing cards for you everywhere. You're getting drove about. There's people, like, screaming your name, etc. And, you know, you're making all this money. But then after the after the months start to go by, rather than every person wanting a photo, every second person wanting a photo, then it's every third person. Then before you know it, no one's really asking for a photo. Then your 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 brand deals. You're not getting name anymore. You're not getting your PAs anymore. So if you don't have a career path previous to the show, or you don't know the direction you're going, then you get that year out of it, and that's it. And put, once you put your management fees and you put your taxes onto that, which most people don't account for, because I've seen the way some of them were spending money when they came out of there because they hadn't been in business before. So their twenty percent tax went to forty percent tax now. Then they've got their twenty percent management fee, sixty percent of their money they don't even have. And which they've not accounted for when they're in Louis Vuitton every other weekend, or they're buying the Range Rovers, or they're buying the Rolexes. And before they know it, the money's gone, and they end up in a worse position than what they actually went on the show. And that causes a lot of people real problems. And the problem is post Love Island as well, is I think that people's egos are too high to go back to a normal job. Because they, they, they're effectively they still think they're famous. But we never were actually famous, you know, like really. What did we do? Like, you know, for my eyes, always, I've always thought, you know, someone that's talented, a singer, an actor, that's, that's fame. We're, we're Z-listers, like, really. I mean, we sat on a beach for nine weeks. That's that's all we've done. Like, anyone can do it. I, I Do you know Chris Williamson, the famous podcaster who's on season one of Love Island? Yes, the pod, yeah, yeah, the bald, he's, uh, bald guy. No. Yeah, Look yeah, at yeah. George, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. he's one of my favourite podcasts, and he talks about how lucky he is to have become famous twice, got famous yeah. from Love Island. And he says yeah. you're, like you said, you're just known for how you look and being on TV. And when people interact yeah. with you, he never really felt it on the streets because it wasn't like if you were to ask them, like, why, why are you want to take the selfie? No one could label the exact reasons to why that he provided value to them besides looking pretty and being on TV. And then he started exactly. podcast, and the podcast has had a million followers. And now people come up to him and not take photos because of Love Island, but because of the yeah. pragmatic lessons and impact that he's had on their life and similar to you that's why i think 
And we're just about to touch on it. Your BBC documentary is such high impact. Because yeah. now people yeah. can come up to you, just like me on this podcast, and say, oh, love, I want to quote with you, Anton, not because you're Love Island, Anton, but because you've yeah. had this profound effect through things such as the documentary and you had your app as well. So it's a very rare experience that you came off and had something with meaning and purpose um, that supported you, opposed to these other people that are just getting recognised for superficial looks and things like that. Yeah, and David, look, it's as easy for me to sit here and say all this now as if I never lost my head a little bit. I lost my head as well. You know, I thought I was more famous than what I actually fucking was as well. And I believe more in bullshit because everyone's blowing smoke up your arse at that time. And I, I did believe it and I've, I've went through my hard times and I've learned the hard way in a lot of ways. But it's brought me back round to going back to who actually I'm and what, what is actually my purpose, which we spoke about is helping as many people as possible live a healthier, happier lifestyle. So I've just went back to that. I've stuck by it. Any jobs I've been offered, you know, I've been offered other reality TV gigs. I, I refuse to do it now because I want to stay true to who I am. You know, I've, I've got my I've got my platform there, but I will not take up any other jobs in TV unless it involves like something that I, I believe in and what I'm actually worth and what I do. And that was when I got the opportunity to present the the BBC documentary on body shame, which just aligns with everything that I'm about. And it was amazing to learn from these um, guys, these young men that had their own experiences as well. It was amazing for me to share my story and people understand where I've came from. And it really changed my outlook to a lot of things and, and really why I've came away from the bodybuilding side of thing and the this, this sort of um, being so obsessed with my own body image as well. Mate. Spot on. This is exactly the trajectory I wanted this podcast to go on. I, I'm really glad that you reached this kind of destination together. This documentary that you did with BBC Scotland. Given that you are you have your own experience with body shame and this opportunity came along to present um, this this amazing TV program, what were some of the biggest struggles that you saw in young men when it came to body shame? Was it more prevalent than you thought, and why, why did this occur? So the one biggest thing that, uh, not fully answering the question, but the biggest thing that I took away from this documentary is people like me can actually be adding fuel to the problem, which I, whenever I posted a photo of my, me being shirtless or whatever, it would actually be to motivate and inspire people. But what it can actually do to a lot of youngsters is make them feel bad about themselves. So they're looking at that and going, well, they, they may be doing well in their own journey, but they're looking up to people like me and thinking, why do I not look like that? Or I'll give you another example, which the actual um, mental health director pointed out to me when we were filming the documentary, which I've never thought of. When people are coming negativi negativity on my post, imagine your normal person looking at that and thinking, if they're being negative towards him, what would they think about me? And that really, that really hit me. I was like, shit, you don't realise, like, these people that are making comments aren't only impacting the people that they're making comments to, but they're impacting people that are reading these comments as well. Because they're thinking, oh, there's Love Island, Anton, who was known as the ripped guy from Love Island and now turned bodybuilder. And if he's not good enough, yes, yeah. you're right. How, how much that? How much yeah. does that feel? Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine putting myself in the shoes of someone, again, I've suffered... I was overweight as a kid. I would have felt the exact same reading something like, like that. And I remember you touched on that documentary that actually some of the most unhappiest people are bodybuilders, the people that are in the fitness industry. Why do you think bodybuilders and fitness models are the most body dysmorphic? What causes it? Because you're always chasing perfection. Mm. So that's as simple as that. It's, it's just pure down to as simple as that. I mean, when you bulk up in bodybuilding, you feel unhappy because you're not as lean. You put on a little bit of body fat, but you're big. When you cut down, you feel small. Or when even you cut down for your bodybuilding show, one thing that I didn't like about the experience, whenever I have went on a diet for holiday, I've always had my holiday to look forward to and I've always been like, oh, I look good for my holiday. Whereas with the bodybuilding, it was always like, is it going to be enough? Is it going to be enough? Well, I don't know, do I need a little bit more off? You know, and you're never ever ever satisfied with it because you always think you can do more. I can imagine, and much 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 like um, your experience with Love Island, 
you are putting yourself out there to be judged and critiqued on the bodybuilding yeah. level. Whereas if you're going on yeah. holiday, no one's going to be like, oh, his deltoid is yeah. bigger than yeah. the people that's around him at the pool. You know what yeah. I mean? Like they're not, cons- they're not you know, scrutinizing you at the same level of degree a judge on a PCA bodybuilding stage would. Yeah. You can imagine yeah. you become so isolated and insular and so fixated on the small details like you said. I never yeah. thought about it like that. Yeah, you're 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 actually so if you you when you even get your cards back, you're not caring about what the what the judges said was good. You're like, well, what did you say was bad, and then that's what you're going to focus on working on for the next year before you compete again. And then it just becomes this constant cycle where you're just constantly unhappy. I mean, I see bodybuilders um, do it all the time on social media when they're in their off season. They're always posting pictures when they are like cut just to give themselves that justification again. You know that like oh I, 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 by the way I do look like this most of the time I could do look like this sometimes I'm not always like this it's like always a justification towards yourself. And to also imagine the environment is such a dictator of your joy because you're comparing yourself if you're a bodybuilder and you're training at these elite gyms under certain coaches you're comparing yourself to the competition you're comparing yeah. comparing yourself to other people who are at the top of that sport yeah. and the the marginal. Or small differences are actually huge differences to you because you can spot them easy, easily because you're comparing to people at, at your um, level. Whereas if you were a bodybuilder and you were to walk down ASDA and compare yourself in, in, in that way, it'd be night and yeah. day, you'd be the top 1% of physiques yeah. and health and fitness. But because you're comparing yourself in a very controlled environment, the, yeah, the, the output is very different. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's when I started to realize it's probably. The most body conscious I ever became was I've always like even to this day I still have my body image struggles. There's there's no two ways about it. There's when I'm slightly out of shape or what I consider out of shape, I still have my days where um I hate it and there's no two ways about it. But when I was doing bodybuilding, it was just constant. It was just constantly thinking you're not good enough. And it's just not a, it just wasn't a, a good mindset for me to be in. I remember the documentary, there was a Kind of statistic that came up, um, it said a quarter of young men feel ashamed about their body in Scotland. Yeah. Given that you've heard that and you saw that and you're part of that documentary, do you have a solution to body shame in Scotland or just in general? What do you think the solution is? That's, that's, that's the funny thing. I, I thought I was going to go and do this documentary and I thought I'm here to solve the problem and I'll work out what the problem is. There is no solution to this problem because the problem is we whether it's social media, whether it's action movies, us as human beings are exposed to things that we shouldn't see. And what we perceive to be the male, you know, the the peak of male body image is this ripped six pack look. So these younger men are always going to look at that. And if they don't have that, feel superior. And the thing is as well is what do you relate a man to? What was a man always related to? When you've seen the gladiators or whatever, it's having muscle. Is, that's what it is. So a lot of men feel less of a man because they don't have muscle. So there is no solution to it. But what can help is people like myself coming out and saying, like I've spoke about, I've had this rip look. I've, I've been what some people will consider the peak of, of the male body image. And I, I wasn't my I was probably one of the most unhappiest I've been. It's not everything. It's not the most important thing. Yes, it's good to stay fit and healthy, but what you need to focus on is just bettering yourself every day and comparing yourself to other people isn't your it's got nothing to do with you compare yourself to the best version of you and do better on yourself every day and that's really what it's about the problem is we just keep looking up to people that even aren't living that life anyway it's like you know i always talk about the the influencer that went on the the airplane and she walked through economy stood in first class, took a photo, posted it, but someone had recorded her doing this. And then she went back and sat in the common room and it was spread all over the, you know, the internet. And it just shows you that people are feeling bad about their own lives, even financially, because they're seeing Ferraris every day. They're seeing things that people driving in first class, eh, traveling in first class. And they're thinking that they should live this life that people aren't even living anyway. I mean, that's maybe my favorite question that I've answered, I've asked because the answer was just so great, mate. I love that. Okay. One of the questions I asked, given that you were on this new, this newfound journey after Love Island, one of the criticisms of hit the headlines and the tabloids were like, "Well, Anton looks very different," and you yeah. had to even go so publicly to like respond to those comments that I've seen online. 
Yeah, um, yeah. What, what's your experience with that, mate? It, it looked horrible to, to that, do online. That, that was difficult. That's probably the most difficult thing that I've had to go through since coming off the show. Bear in mind, when I came off the show, it was very much all love. And then, you know, I took this decision to go into bodybuilding and I knew I had to do an off-season. And I was always putting it off doing it because I knew I would have to put on X amount of weight. And with that, I knew there was going to be the trolls coming online. But little did I expect it to come the way it came. Literally anything I posted, people were talking about the way my face looked, how much weight I'd put on. And I was really close to giving up with it and just start dieting again. So what was the worst thing about it is you're getting called fat again, but now as an adult, but by millions of people. So you're just going through that same childhood trauma that you went through. So it was really, really difficult time for me to go through. But when it came to my dieting phase, that was just the drive I needed because I knew I was going to show everyone. Um, it gave me an extra drive because I was like, right, wait till you just fucking see what I can do. And now you'll understand why I've done what I've done. This wasn't an accident. I knew what I was doing. And, you know, I lost I lost 50 pounds in 12 weeks. That experience reminds me exactly of the time you were out on a night out and your mates who once slagged you came up to you to tell you how great shape you were in and you said, yeah, and you've got beer bellies, etc., etc. Yeah. Like the mm-hmm. whole look at me now moment. Um, yeah, and then I, exactly. I saw your photos on stage at PCA and you were looked phenomenal, mate. You looked yeah. amazing. Yeah. And the, do you know the, the hard thing to come by that now, though, is you then compare yourself to that. So I smell, I never ever want to just sit here and, you know, sound as if I found a solution and as if I'm this perfect person now. I'm, I'm, a, I'm definitely not. I'm still working on myself every day. And I, I think as humans, we, we, we do always have to work on ourselves every day. And I think a childhood trauma will never, ever leave someone. I think it will always be there and things will always trigger it. And yeah, I mean, I'll now look at the photos and I got very lean from my holiday in Ibiza this year and it wasn't good enough. And, you know, I do battle with these things every day. So I do want to make that clear that, you know, I do still struggle with my own body image, definitely as well. Such a transparent message. If Anton can be transparent about this, we all can. Really great message, mate. I want to leave the podcast by asking you, like, what's next? What's the mission that you're currently on? What are you pursuing now? The mission never changed from day one. It was help to help as many people as possible live a healthier, happier lifestyle. And that's genuinely the truth. That's fitness is genuinely what changed my life. And I want to help as many people do the same. And now I've been able to do it on a bigger level than I ever could have imagined. Um, but I want to be a little bit more transparent about things. I want to, one thing the documentary has made me realize that, that it's not all about body image, you know? As much as, if this was the one question that got me um, in the documentary, and I'll, I'm going to ask you the same question, David. Do you do you train? Yeah, I train five days a week. Right, okay, right. It doesn't look if like you, that, no, mate. <laughs> no. So, if you were to, if you were to not have any difference in your body image, would you still train? Truthfully. You're going to be surprised. I know what the common answer to this is. For me, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Other times in my life, 100% no. It's solely because of how I looked and how I felt about myself. Yeah. Growing up as the overweight, um, unpopular kid, there was a very yeah. similar point at the age of 16. I joined the gym and got shredded. I had a six pack for the first time in my life. And I was yeah. going on summer holidays where the girls in my year group at school were saying how great I look in comparison to how they used to bill me for being chubby. Yeah. I, I have been below 10% body fat. Really great condition, but now the gym is, because I'm so busy, the podcast, I have so many creative endeavours, I do exercise for the brain now. The release, yeah. Because I've, I've been through that same life cycle as you on a very muted level. I've never been in the shape yeah. that you've been in, but I've had that yeah. kind of fitness menopause, as many people call it, where I was like, okay, I'm doing this for other people, and I didn't enjoy it, and then I went back to style of training that I now enjoy that benefits my mind, which is um, more of like boxing and weightlifting. But previously, yeah. to answer your question, there was a yeah. very... A very prominent version of David that only trained because he didn't like his love handles and got called by yeah. school. Yeah, and do you know what? Like, I, I was the same when I got asked the question. I actually really had to think about it, and I thought I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't, and that's someone that lives and breathes this. But why do I live and breathe it just for the way I look? Then, so it really, the documentary really opened my eyes to a lot of things, and it's made me realise that I want to really take fitness away from 
the the body image change that's going to come that is going to naturally come if you enjoy the process of getting it it's like like we spoke about my whole journey it's all happened because i've enjoyed the process and it's just opened up the same will happen with your your fitness journey as well you will get to where you need to be but first you have to enjoy the process of getting it and that's really what I'm, I'm really about now is just really transforming from, you know, Anton, which is very much all about toning, to balance by Anton. And it's, it's creating that balance in people's lives. Fantastic. I mean, I, I love that mission that you've been on. If the people want to get in contact, because they don't already follow you, which I'm sure they do, where the, can the people get in contact with Anton and Balance by Anton? Yeah, so probably, well, we've got the own website, balancedbyanton.com, and also, as well, my Instagram is um, anton underscore Danielic. Amazing, mate. One last question for me. If yeah. you were to be able to go back in time and give young Anton advice before you step foot into Love Island, or any young, specifically man, or if not woman, who is considering reality TV, do you have any tips that you would give to them um, before stepping foot into a place like Love Island? Be careful what you wish for. I think that's all we need to hear from you, mate. This has been so much fun, mate. I've really, really enjoyed this. Long time overdue, and I'm glad we did it. Perfect. Thank you, mate.